All right. We're going to continue with lessons from the master. This is lesson 27, topical number 751, Wednesday, January the 20th, 2021. Time just keeps rolling right along. I entitled this lesson, The Lens of Agape Love. I originally had it entitled The Prism, but I just changed it to lens, like looking through a lens, seeing things from God's perspective as we look at the Bible. <laughs> but we want to look at it from the perspective of the Bible as Christ gives this commandment in this passage uh, this evening in John chapter 13. So as we continue in this series, we're going to be in verses 31 through 35 this evening, and we'll close up chapter 13 Sunday, Lord willing. So much has happened in your mind as you go through the week. You may look at your notes. You may see things uh, in your notes that are um, uh, remind you of what we've been studying and again, this being the last evening he is with these disciples uh, before he is taken into captivity, or as it were, allows himself to be taken into captivity uh, by the uh, religious uh, fanatics of that day. And uh, though they thought they were doing the right thing, according to the law, the law always had behind it. God always had the law to help point people to his holiness and his righteousness. But when you look at Deuteronomy, the last book before they went into the promised land with Joshua, and Deuteronomy chapter 6, one of the passages that always stands out to me, where it's so often you see that the many of the Jewish religious community we basically ran the show for the Jewish people regarding the law, regarding to deeds, contracts, celebrations, etc. for the nation of Israel, and is that it, this, and, not, and it wasn't the, always the case. It wasn't always the case. At one time, it was a loving community of people. At one time, though there was always dis, uh, dissidents to it, and prosel proselytes, being drawn to it by other Gentile nations, it wasn't always uh, a violent type of leadership. It wasn't always idolatrous leadership all the time. There were times when they had good kings, and they prospered, and they had good successes from time to time. But eventually it got to where the leadership that was of a righteous nature became less and less influential and the people became more and more wicked and the people did not want righteousness to prevail and eventually they started turning on their preachers or prophets of that day and it got really bad but in Deuteronomy chapter 6 it says in verse 4 because by inspiration Moses is sharing with the people before they would go into uh, the land of Canaan. They didn't go in with him. Uh, God did not let him go. God judged him uh, in the sense that he would not let him go in because he had disrespected God in front of the people when he struck the rock at Meribah. But it says in verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. He's reminding them before they go in under Joshua's leadership. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. And shalt talk of them when you sit down in your house, and when you walk in the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up, and bind them as a sign upon thy hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thy house eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the house, the post of thy house, and on thy gates. And it shall be when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land which he swore unto thy fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give thee great and 
goodly cities which thou buildest not, houses full of all good things which thou fillest not, and wells which you did not dig, vineyards and olive trees which you did not plant, because you're getting what someone else had done before you got there. When thou shalt have eaten and be full, then beware lest thou forget the Lord who brought thee out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. And so his intent of the Lord in verse 5 of Deuteronomy 6 is that the people would learn to love God, to learn to appreciate God, to have gratitude for all the things that God does. And when you have a nation of people that have lost a sense of gratitude for the efforts of other people and the people start to feel like they are entitled to things, then your nation goes into iniquity, idolatry, and corruption. And that's what Israel had become in its end days before it was dispersed in 70 A.D. It had become. And yes, there was a remnant, according to grace in that day, who were still positive. Let's always remember that, that there are always going to be those of Israel who are true believers, who are very loyal to the word of God and believe in Jesus as their Messiah. They're, often they're called Messianic Jews. But there are uh, Christian denomination Jews as well that who, who are, I don't say Christian denomination, I'll say this, they're Protestant Jews who, like you and I, sit down and study the Bible exegetically, historically, messianically. They'll know that there's a day coming when their people, it might be after their time, but their people, because they're in the church, but their people in the future will have the opportunity to have all the blessings that God wanted them to have at first, but the people just kept turning away and away and away. They forgot the Lord. They forgot the Lord. So I always wanted to say, when it comes to the Jewish people, they are wonderful people, talented, intelligent, strong-willed. But when that strong will goes against the will of God, it can be very ugly. And uh, God held them to a different level than he did any other nation on the face of the earth, and he still does. So anyone who gets saved now who's Jewish is a part of the church. We understand that. But love was the theme in the Old Testament as well, not just in the New Testament. It's not a different God in the Old Testament than the God in the New Testament. It's the same one. John chapter 13. This is our study as we continue in John's account of what took place the night of the Last Supper. It had the foot washing had been done. He had uh, uh, foretold that one would betray him. And as quietly as he could, he made the offer to Judas to uh, to either receive the sop, as it were, or just the, the bread in the, in, the, in the soup or whatever it was they had there that was a part of the way they ate. And he would hand it to this person who would betray him. And that person had the opportunity to say, you know what, I, I can't do this. As I said Sunday, I could, he could have turned away. It was his last chance to, to repent, and he wouldn't do it. He loved the money. He loved uh, what it would do for him, and he just couldn't shake it. He was not saved to start with. But even sometimes believers don't seem to be able to shake the, that irresistible desire to do something that is self-destructive. But Judas never had believed in the Lord. He was a twelfth disciple as we saw last time but anyway in verse 31 it says therefore when he was gone out that's Judas verse 30 says he then having received the sop went immediately out and it was night as I said he went out into the dark alone that's sad Therefore, when he was gone out, Jesus says, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified with him. That is the Son of Man. If God be glorified in him, God shall also glorify him in himself and shall straightway glorify him. A whole lot of glorifying going on here, isn't it? Little children, very tender term, yet a little while I am with you, ye shall seek me, 
As I said unto the Jews, where I go, you cannot come. So now I say to you. Then he says, a new commandment I give unto you that you love one another. As I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love, love one to another. Let's pray. Father, we ask as we go into your word tonight, you'll help us to have our eyes and hearts open to your truth, your word. Help us to have be one in conscience with you, one in thought with you, one in heartbeat with you, one in thought with you. Lift us up, we pray, Father, to that level. We realize that as fallen beings, those saved, we still have within each one of us the remnant of that old sin nature. It still tries to tug at us so many different ways, so many different times of the day. Help us, Father, to realize that it only pulls us away from you and pulls us down. And so we pray, Father, that you'll lift us up again tonight and encourage us again as we need it. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. As we continue in John's account of what took place the night of the Lord's Supper, once Judas lit out to fulfill his desire for that money by betraying the Lord, which he would do later that night, Jesus then said, it is on. <laughs> he didn't say it like that, but he said, Therefore, when he was gone, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified. That's significant. The original language in the word now means it's begun. And God is glorified in him. Because Jesus is going to be doing what God sent him here to do in the first place. In John chapter 6, Jesus said in verse 38 in John chapter 6, For I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will who hath sent me, that of all that he had given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of the Father that sent me, that everyone who seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Verse 47 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life and that glorifies God because we are his highest creation we are made in the image of almighty God and through sin that image is tarnished but in Christ the image is brought to life it's brought back to life the luster is brought back God is happy in other words it's hard to come up with a word that actually effectively tells us what the word glorified means it means God's got a big grin on his face God is smiling. God is pleased. And God, in doing so, becomes radiant with joy. Because the creature that he made in his image, of all the creation he had, of all the beings that he made, made angels, he made all the animals, and some of them are wonderful, some of them are terrifying, some of them are just, I don't know what they are. They have their purpose. But when he made us, he made us in his image. That is, in his image of soul image. God is a soul, and he's a spirit. And God's soul image has a mentality, it has a will, it has emotion, it has self-awareness or self-consciousness, and it has a conscience, a standard, which it is called divine righteousness. And God is constantly trying to lift us in all of our five major aspects of our soul. He's constantly trying to bring us to that level that he intended for Adam, the first Adam, to hold to first place, which he let go of when he sinned in disobedience to God. And so once you get saved, God's spirit indwells you, and God quickens or brings to life your human spirit, and God works with his word through your spirit to have effect upon those five aspects of your soul. You know, five is the number of grace in the scripture. And so God raises you up higher to closer to looking like him when you're being uh, agreeing in your life with God. You know that. And that glorifies God. And it, you can share in that glory. There's nothing greater. We're so materialistically oriented in this world that 
the more you have, the more bling you have, the more money and power and influence you have, supposedly the more glory you have. That is the exact opposite of God's glory. It says in 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, that the glory that's of this world, the things of this world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, they are not of the Father, but are of this world. And they all pass away. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. That glory of God is him seeing his reflection in you and me. And the way we think, the way we live, the way we treat one another, that's the glory of God. The glory of man and the glory of God are two different things. And if you're seeking for the glory of man, according to what 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17 teaches, which, which is found only in people power and in the world and in materialism, then we've missed the boat if that's the way we think. The Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. Jesus says, this is, about to, uh, this is about to happen. Now, I want us to note something here, too. Therefore, when he was gone, Jesus says, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. The title, Son of Man, attributed to Jesus Christ, is a name he has given according to Daniel chapter 7 and verse 13. He's called the Son of Man. Daniel 7 and verse 13. Daniel says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. That's Jesus Christ in his millennial reign. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. So, 80 times, 80 times, that's 8 zero, 80 times Jesus Christ calls himself the Son of Man. He is the full representation of what God wanted to see in Adam to start with. Though Jesus is perfect and sinless, Adam was made sinless too. Of course, Adam was made out of a dirt ball, a big spitball, clay. And God breathed into his nostrils the soul life of lies, and it became a living soul and a living spirit. But the Son of Man is a term where God is trying to say, I would I want people to be like my son. Their love, their character, their integrity, their obedience, and Jesus Christ showed that all the way. He is the full representation of what God wanted to see in man. This is why he is named the second Adam. And so it is written. Now, this is in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 45 through 48, and I'll just read it. And so it is written, the first Adam, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a life-giving spirit. However, that was not first which is spiritual, that is, Adam was not originally created spiritual, but that which is natural. And after that, the second Adam is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthly. He absolutely was. He was made out of the dust of the ground. And the second man is the Lord from heaven. That's where he came from. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As is the earthly, such are they also that are earthly, after Adam's kind. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly, that are after Christ's kind. So if you're just uh, if you're an unsaved person, you're still, in God's eyes, considered just earthly, not heavenly or heaven-bound. But if you are in Christ, you're not just from the earth, but you're also heaven-bound now. Jesus Christ is also named the Son of David. There's three different things here. He's named the Son of Man, the Son of David, and the Son of God. He's called the Son of David, distinguishing, distinguishing his Jewish roots. 
and claim to the throne of the king of the Jews. When he talks about him referring to Jesus Christ as the son of David, it's pointing us to the fact that it was a promise to Abraham, a covenant God made with him, that of his lineage, that there would be one who would come who would be the king of the Jews who would have an everlasting kingdom. And then lastly, he's also, as a title of our Lord, is called the Son of God. And of course, that speaks of his divine origin and his divine nature. So John 13, 32, as deity and glory to the G, at, that Jesus Christ did manifest in his life, it is a glory that is shared with the Father. So going to the cross would glorify the Father. That's um, something else. If you want to back up to the Old Testament prophet Isaiah, I'll give you time. I'll take it out of Georgia Overdrive and let you go to Isaiah chapter 53. Most of you know where we're going with this. I said going to the cross would glorify the father because there the father's justice God's justice would be served and satisfied it would be fulfilling God's demands his just demands on behalf of mankind his highest creation to help bring us back to God we cannot get back to God without justice being satisfied we were made in God's image, and that image was broken by sin. And every one of us, and all of people, of all of mankind, and God wants us to be able to come back to him. And we can't come back to him in our own efforts, in our own morality, in our own religion, in our own rituals, in our own good works or whatever. We can't come back to him through that. We have to come back after we have been purified, and we can't purify ourselves of our own efforts, we have to be in Christ. Only through Christ can we be deemed purified. And that's through the blood of Christ. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. There is no forgiveness of sin. And the only person that was qualified to shed his blood as a perfect sacrifice, a sinless sacrifice, is Jesus Christ. None of us could have shed our blood and saved a soul, much less our own. Jesus would be that sacrifice for the sins of all mankind. So in Isaiah 53, verse 10, it says, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. This is God the Father, to bruise him. That is, for Jesus to be suffering. He hath put him to grief. Six hours on the cross when he went. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. Well, the soul doesn't leave the body until the body dies, does it? Unless you're raptured up. When that, there's only one group that's going to, that's going to happen to. I mean, all believers, but one generation of believers that that's going to happen to. The rest of us uh, will die before then. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. You've got to know Jesus Christ knew this passage when he was a teenager. He didn't fully understand it. Jesus, it's one of the understanding about the humanity of Christ is that God revealed to him on, in real time the things that he was learning, and he was learning it 100% as he was experiencing it. Because when he made the offer to be the king of the Jews when he first came out in his ministry to offer up the gospel of the kingdom, he wasn't being disingenuous. It was a real offer. But as he was rejected, he saw scripture that he had studied as a younger person, and it reflected to him the will of the people. And it also revealed to him and helped him to understand that his destiny wasn't going to end with sitting on a throne somewhere uh, while he was in his life and the first time he came. Because he also read in the scripture of the second coming of Christ, as Daniel had given years, 700 years earlier. 
Let's see. Let me just get that straight, because I'm kind of a stickler for that kind of stuff. 6th century B.C., 600 years earlier. But anyway, it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. That is the offspring who got saved in receiving Jesus as their Savior, in receiving Jesus' sacrifice for their sins. He was made an offering for sin. He shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hands. He shall see the travail of his soul. The Father saw the travail of the soul of Jesus and shall be satisfied. That's the word propitiation. Hilasmos. Satisfaction. He shall be satisfied by his knowledge. Shall my righteous servant justify many. So you're not justified until you are in Christ. But my righteous servant, the Father referring to the Son, my righteous servant shall justify many. God knew that not everyone would believe, but he would give them the opportunity. For he shall bear their iniquities. And remember, Jesus knew that the Bible said without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins or remission of sins. So being in sin, and I want us to try to be in the moment with Christ. But what was going through his mind, what he was trying to, to relate to these disciples, as good-hearted as they were, they were still, like we are at times, dull of understanding. I know I am sometimes. But being in sin, mankind besmirches the name of God. Besmirches the face of God. When God looks at mankind since the cross, God sees Jesus' substitutionary sacrifice as payment for all of those sins. Whether you go to hell when you die or not, whether you believe in God in this life or not, God knows that there was a sufficient, suitable, acceptable sacrifice for every soul that ever goes to hell. God knows that there was a suitable sacrifice that he did all he could do to redeem broken, fallen mankind. All of the sins of the world have already been paid for. In 1 John chapter 2 and verse 2 it says, And he is the propitiation, the hilasmas, or the satisfaction. Jesus' life and death on the cross became an oblation, as it were, a poured out sacrifice as his life was poured out on the cross. For our sins. And not for ours only, as 1 John 2.2 2 says, but also for the sins of the hot loss, the whole entire world. The Greek word there, all loss, means entire world. Not just for the sins of the people who get saved and go to heaven when they die, but also for the sins of those who reject Christ and go to hell when they die. Jesus died for them. He is, the Bible says in Timothy, the Savior of the world. There's no other savior of the world. You think, well, there's the Buddhist, the Hindu. There's the Muslim faith. Well, they all got to come through Jesus to get saved. You got to stop being a Hindu, a Muslim, a Buddhist. You got to become a believer in Jesus Christ to be saved. And we'll talk about that some here coming up pretty soon that Christianity is very narrow, but Jesus even says that the path to heaven is a narrow path. It's not a broad path. It's a narrow path. Truth is truth whether we like it or not. And you'll find yourself more happy living in the light than you do living in the shade. Now, we know what darkness is. It's evil. It's sinful. It's bad. And we know what light is. It's, it's righteousness. It's purity. It's goodness. It's true sincerity, not a, not a fake. But we also know that often between the extreme of evil and the extreme of righteousness, there's a lot of gray area. Well, living in the gray does not make a person happy. It might help you to get along with the world while you're down here, but inside it doesn't make you happy as a Christian. The more you live in the light, the better off you are. What we have to be careful of is that the more that we live in the light, that we do not become self-righteous and become judgmental of people who choose to live in the gray or in the black. 
And the unsaved lived in, live in the dark all the time. They may not realize it, but a lot of the believers live in the gray. I guess we all do to a certain degree. We understand that. I've drawn this little diagram before. We are in Christ. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13. That we are sealed. Ephesians 1 and verse 13. We are sealed. And it's perfect tense. It's completed action and past time. From whenever you got saved. Continuously. So in Jesus Christ. He, he's the center here. And here's the world. Here's where we lived, lost, and you may have be, I could have been as an unsaved person, a good church going young man or young woman, an older man or older woman, makes no difference. But everybody in the world who is outside of Christ is lost, whether they're religious or not. But when you come into Christ, I mean, through the word of God, we learn more, we come closer, we can stay right here. You know, I'm trying to put these little things like we're not Jesus Christ, but we want to stay close to him. And the light's really bright here. And you try to live in that light. You try to live that righteous life. And you're more blessed by it. But you're going to be more persecuted by the world for doing this. You may be more persecuted by your family for doing this. Whoever lives close to Christ is going to be persecuted by the world. And Jesus himself prophesied that the servant is never greater than his master. But that's okay. He's got you. He's got to take care of you. But if you want to live on the fringes out here, and I don't say that you do, but if we as Christians want to live out here in this area, you're still saved. But out here, you know, it's a little, it can get a little sketchy. You know? And it's just full out darkness out here. Okay, so the gray area, well, let's say this is the gray area right out here. The gray area right in here is where we try to live on the fringes of the world more than close to Christ for whatever reason. We don't like being picked on. We don't like people thinking that we're a freak or whatever. Uh, we like some of the stuff the world has to offer. And that's okay. You can enjoy that and be close to Christ if you're living right. Some people can't seem to have blessings and live right. That's what the whole thing that we talked about in Deuteronomy chapter 6 is about. God says, I want you to love me with your heart, your mind, your soul, your whole being. But don't forget me. Because if you get, forget me, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to discipline you. Things are not going to go so good. So in this gray area right here, we want to live a little closer to where we can find a little comfort here, a little church here, a little good here, a little peace here, but they'll also like to have, you know, be cozy with the world. We would like people to think well of us. We don't like people to think, well, she's a jerk. He's a jerk. He, he, he won't go along with me on this. It's just a little thought, something. But we realize that it's not, I can't be close to Jesus and agree with that. The more the Word of God, Bible doctrine that we get, the more we understand the mind of Christ. And the more we understand the mind of Christ, the more we see the benefit of being in a right walk with the Lord. Amos 3, 3, 3, 3 chapter 3 and verse 3 says, How can two walk together except they be agreed? And so, this gray area right in here, because once we start leaving the light, we're going to go into the gray because that's the little shadow before you get to where the dark is. You're still saved. You're still sealed, kept by the Holy Spirit. So you're not going to lose your salvation, but you're going to lose your peace. You're going to lose your joy, and you're going to not share in the glory. You know, they said with Moses when he came off the mountain that his face did shine. <laughs> I thought that was going to happen tonight when I lit that uh, gas uh, logs, but I'm glad that didn't happen. 
<laughs> Everything was just fine. But anyway, Jesus died for the whole world. The unsaved thus do not go to hell when they are finally judged at the end of time. They do not end up in eternal separation from God, which is called the second death. They do not experience that separation from a God specifically because of their personal sins, because their sins have been paid for and covered by Jesus Christ's sacrifice on the cross. So he's paid the penalty for that judgment. I want us to understand that he's paid the penalty for their judgment. His resurrection from the dead then proved the Father's acceptance of Jesus Christ's sacrifice for the sins of the whole world of humanity. Romans 4, verse 25. So then why do the lost go to hell? Why are they eternally separated from God and happiness and joy and peace and paradise? Why do they go to hell? Because the Bible says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 10 and in John chapter 3 and verse 16, it's very clear that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Well, they refuse to receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. The love of the truth is that Christ died for their sins that they might be saved. The unsaved are now in a place called Hades. There's no one in actually the lake of fire yet. The devil is not in the lake of fire with a pitchfork poking at people as the comics uh, try to lead us to believe. There's no one there. The unsaved are in Hades, a place that departed spirit, also a place, a part of souls, excuse me, and a place that is also seen as a place of torment. The unsaved are in Hades awaiting their judgment at the end of time, only then to be sentenced to eternal separation from God in the lake of fire. Another word for hell, Gehenna. They will not be there because of their sin per se, because you have sinned too. Why is it that you're not in hell and they are? Ask your, That's a good way to, to answer that question too. Why is it that you are going to heaven and they're not? And all, the only thing you can say if you know salvation is because I've accepted Jesus Christ as my sin substitute. I, he's my Savior. Exact, correct answer. They have not. That's why we are giving the gospel out to people. That's most important. We all sin, but we do not all go to hell. But they which have rejected the Son of God who paid for their sins will be there. Their lives are thus judged, and so is their future eternity, as John writes in the book of Revelation. When God sees the unsaved, he does not see forgiven people. He does not see pardoned people. They have not yet been pardoned for what they have done. They, the, what they had done has been paid for, but they have not accepted the pardon. You're getting ready to do 30 years of hard time in a federal penitentiary, and someone says, well, I'll come in and pay the price for that 30 years that you're going to spend in a federal pen to let you go. If you, re, if you accept their pardon, you're released. Now, I know it doesn't work that way. You're released. But if you reject that pardon, you're going to do the 30 years. Well, when it comes to hell, you're going to do eternity. God knows there was payment made for their sins, but in rejecting the one who paid for their sins, they have refused the pardon. I hope none of you have refused the pardon. Subsequently, the unsaved face the second death, eternal separation from God. That's what that means. The lost or the unsaved face the second death, as their future eternity, separation from God, from heaven, from love, from light, from joy, from laughter, from peace, all of these things. And this is based on the full accounting of their lives, which is being written down in real time during their lives. 
written down in a book to be read on their judgment day, Revelation 20, verse 12 through 13. And out of those books, the, the people, they're all unsaved there. Out of those books, the lost people will have before them the things written which they have done, the Bible says, according to their works, not according to their sins. Remember, we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. What's the difference in the category of those at the great white throne and those who don't have to go there for eternal judgment? The difference is those at the great white throne are there based, they're judged out of their works. You're not judged out of your works. You're judged because of the work of Jesus Christ. And when you receive Jesus Christ as your work for salvation, you're completely in. You've got an eternal insurance policy based on the integrity of God to keep you. But out of the book of their works are they judged. And the Bible says they're according to their works, not according to their sins. Not according to their sins. People have done good works to pay for their sins. Some unknowingly were trying to do good things because in their conscience they felt bad about something they did to somebody, so they try to make it up to them, be nice to them, flatter them, give them a little something extra, whatever. It's like the man who's been cruel to his wife, and and, and he, she's been crying all day long, and somebody shows up knock on the door with a bouquet of flowers. Well, that ain't going to take back those bad words, those harsh words, or whatever else might have gone on. The damage might have already been done. It takes a while to repair it, even if it's possible, if it gets bad enough. But a lot of times, people try to make up for doing something bad to someone, and they'll try to do a little something here, a little something there, and, and they get mad when people won't accept them trying to do a little something good for them, because they're just trying to ease their conscience. That's the proof that people try to do good to cover evil or to try to offset the bad. And they say feel the same way about going to heaven and dying and meeting God. Others purposely think their good deeds and their human righteous deeds is going to offset any bad thing that they have done. And they minimize the bad and they exalt the good, of course. But the Bible says, by no works of the law shall a man be justified, that is, declared righteous to God. I'm bringing all this out because I thought it was important at the time because when you look at what Jesus Christ is getting ready to do, we want to share in his glory, not live in the gray or not live in the dark. The unsaved during their life on earth who will not receive the person of Jesus Christ as their sin bearer, their substitute, who reject Jesus Christ are rejecting God the Father in heaven too. So you say, well, I'm going around Jesus Christ. I'm going straight to the big guy. I'm going straight to God. Well, you can't get there. John 14, 6 says you can't get there. Jesus says except through him. The Father would no way in the world let Jesus Christ go through all the burden of sorrow and suffering that he went through and then give you a back door into heaven. He just It's not going to happen. God's got too much integrity to that. And he loves his son too much. And it makes it just as easy for one as it does the other. Whether you're black or white, red or brown, it doesn't make any difference the color of your skin. Whether you're a man or a woman, it doesn't make any difference what nation you're out of. You get a chance to be saved. Some nations you'll lose your life for professing Christ as they did in their day. You know, of the 12 disciples, of course, all of them except John died a martyr's death. When Paul was added to take care, take the place of Judas, they all died except for John, and he was. They tried to kill him. The emperor Domitian, who was the uh, Roman emperor at the time, sought to kill John. He was he was put in a big vat of boiling oil, and John didn't die from it. And they had their laws of what was right and just, and so he did not put him back into some other form of punishment. He exiled him to an isle of Patmos, as it's named. And therefore, John received the book of the Revelation. John was an old man, nearly 90 years of age, if not older, when he was exiled to the isle of Patmos. Imagine that. Live that long and then be exiled to live out on a barren rock area with other uh, people who had been banished. 
Anyway, the unsaved have their many reasons for wanting to hold on to their independence from God's presence in their lives, Judas being one of those. They all have their reason for wanting to hold on to their independence from God and his presence and his influence in their life. Well, you're going to meet him anyway, so why wait? Jesus said in John 3.19 that those who are lost, who will not receive Christ, who don't want that type of a life, Jesus said they do that because they love what they do. They love their darkness and what goes on in their dark thoughts and actions. To God's viewpoint, it's darkness. They don't think it is, but God says they love darkness over light because their deeds are evil, not righteous. Paul says they who commit such sins know the judgment of God that such things are worthy of death, Romans one thirty two. But they love the pleasure they receive from living their lives as they choose whether God likes it or not. So they love their life unto death. They love their life unto eternal separation from God. And God grants them their wish. These are the Father's own words. That all men should honor the Son even as they honor the Father. This is in John 5 and verse 23. All men should honor the Son even as they honor the Father. He that honors not the Son honors not the Father who has sent him. And the term, term honor there, time, means to show the same value, the equality. Now I know the Muslim people, they feel that they came from Abraham and they feel like they are part of the Abrahamic faith. The Jewish people feel like they also are of Abraham. The three major religions, Christianity, uh, uh, the Muslim faith, and then the Jewish faith, that we all are associated and connected back to Abraham. Of course, the truth of the matter is no man comes unto the Father except through the Son. And Abraham's son, Ishmael was not of the promised seed, but Isaac was. Jesus is of that same lineage of Isaac, not Ishmael. If you don't show the same equality of the son, Jesus, as you show, as you would think to the father, the father won't receive you. And there's a message that people need to get. That there are people, like those of the Muslim faith, who show some respect to Jesus as at least a prophet. That's as far as they will go. But they will not acknowledge that he is the son of God because if they do, they couldn't follow the Muslim faith anymore. They'd have to become a Christian. A follower of Christ. The anointed of God. That's what you are as a Christian. You are a follower of Christ. The word Christos is the same word as anointed. He's the same as the Messiah. He is God in the flesh. And if you will not receive Jesus as God in the flesh, then you are rejecting the Father who sent him. John 5 and verse 23. So many people all over the world have received and continue to receive false gods or a false estimation of who God is and what God expects. But the one and only divine God who is revealed to the world is only revealed in the person, of course, of Jesus Christ. So in verses 33 through 35, in this little close up here, Jesus said, little children, yet a little while I am with you. You shall seek me as I said unto the Jews, where I go you cannot come, so now I say to you, a new commandment I'm going to give to you, that you love one another as I've loved you, that you also love one another. The greatest commandment then is given here. It is given in a very tender way. He had told the Jews before in John 8, 21, that he came from heaven and from the Father. And he was going to go back to the Father, and they would not understand it. They could not understand that. And he's also told them that he was going to go somewhere that they would never go if they stayed in their unbelief. He was going home to the Father, and he was ready.
I want us to understand that by this time the next day he was dead. By this time the next afternoon he was dead. Died on the cross. To tell us that it is finished and he shouted it is finished and he gave up the spirit it says. Jesus says until we come are together again I want to give a new commandment unto you that you love one another agape that is unconditionally love one another as I have unconditionally loved you and by that demonstration of love all men shall know that you are my disciples doesn't mean we have to like everybody that's fake you can't like everybody nobody not everybody can like you that's something a lot of young people need to understand when they go into middle school maybe this fifth or sixth grade now and into high school some kids kill themselves because so and so doesn't like them Nobody has to like you. They have a right to not like you. They don't have to like you. But they have to be fair and honest. They're supposed to be kind. They're supposed to be gentle. They're supposed to be forgiving. They're not supposed to use bad language toward you, either in front of you or behind your back. They're not supposed to gossip. Because if you have agape love towards someone, which is a higher quality of love, you are taking the high road. So often it has become so commonplace today, even in grade schools, that it, you start off defending yourself to where you will take the low road and you'll stay there until you are old and they throw the dirt in your face and put up a marker with your name on it. And I guess the question would be, what happened to your life in the dash, as the country song goes? My life, your life in the dash. In other words, 1956 dash whatever 2222 whatever <laughs> what happens in the dash how did you live your life were you so concerned with what other people thought of you that you didn't care how you treated them we need to learn how to treat others because we're going to answer for it. The unsaved will answer too. God wants us to love one another. That's agape, unconditional love. I have unconditional love for one another. It doesn't mean that you accept everything that everybody does. you got to let some stuff just roll off of you. Look what happened with Jesus and Judas there. Jesus had just kind of let that roll off of him. He knew what was going to happen. With our human instinct... And we all have it of self-preservation, last sentence, next to last sentence. With our human instinct and our nature to self-preserve, our nature to self-praise and self-exalting and self-advancement, unconditional love on our part is a big request. And originally entitled this lesson, The Big Ask, but I thought it wouldn't sound right for somebody might hear it. They might think I was saying something else. The big ask, A-S-K, that's a big ask. Can you show unconditional love to me? Can I show unconditional love to you? And we've studied that in detail. Pastor Frampton, formerly a pastor who's down with the Lord, he taught that in detail. I've taught it some, but it's when your character is on trial, not someone else's. How do you treat people? It's a big commandment. It's a big order. So we need to look through the lens of agape love when we see things, when we see people, whether it's the color of their skin, their political affiliation, whether we think it's cray-cray or not, we have to understand that in the big picture, God's not going to judge us whether or not we were a good conservative Christian, but if we were a good Christian, and how we're going to be judged as whether or not we're a good Christian is if we have agape love. Of course, agape love means you will at times, if you have to, in the military, that's the where it's supposed to happen, take up arms or defend your family in your home. It's one thing. You, can, you have a right to defend yourself. You have a right to defend your family in your home. That's the way God ordained. And when civil disobedience is 
spoken of in the scripture. It has to do with you not being able to share the gospel. We're not there. We're not anywhere near that. And so I, I think we just need to understand that our world has not come to an end because Joe Biden is now the president. That's just foolishness. And I know y'all don't feel that way. But th there's going to be some crazy things that we might not like. There's a lot of things that happened that a lot of people who didn't win the last time didn't like either. We understand that. And we'll say, well, we were right. And they're saying, well, we were right. And it goes on and on. Not everybody was raised in a little house in a, in a little wooden frame house with a picket fence with a cow and a chicken and a hay barn and a pond and whatever. A lot of people, most of the people in America are, were raised in urban cities. That's where our voting block is changed. People are raised in, there are more people in urban societies than there are in rural societies as a block of people. And their understanding of the way they came through life and what they were born into is nothing like what we were born to. Nothing. I was raised basically, as it were, like one of the Waltons. Like one of the Waltons. My life experience and what I went through as a child was wonderful. Though we worked like rented mules, it was wonderful on that farm. When you're got up, you've got when they, you're 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 made to get up at four thirty or five o'clock in the morning to milk cows as a seven year old boy, six year old boy, get jerked out of the covers if you don't. I remember knowing that I was going to get a licking if I didn't soon get out there. And oftentimes, I would go out there to get the cattle in in nothing but my shorts and bare feet in the fall of the year when it was frost on the ground to make sure I got them going because Daddy was already at the barn, the milk parlor, making sure that everything was ready to start the milkers and getting all that ready, getting the feed down. My brother would be putting the feed down in the barn. The lights would be on, and all I could see from the distance was the light from the dairy barn. And I would be going out through the fields, going through briars and brambles, you name what it is, because the cattle hadn't uh, roused up yet. Well, we had to get that done before we went to school. And I can remember going out sometimes knowing if I didn't get out there and get going, I was going to be in trouble. So I'd go out there and I'd stand where the cows were laying to get my feet warm because it was so cold. And every once in a while, I'd stand in something else to warm my feet up on the way to the barn. And I didn't care. It was cold and I was barefoot. That's the world that I grew up in. The hazy, lazy days of summer. We had hazy, lazy days of summer, just goofing off, swimming in the creek, creek doing whatever we wanted to do, going fishing, you name it. Throwing eggs at each other. Not the good ones, the ones that the hens would lay out in the barn rather than in the nest. Those were collected, but every once in a while we'd have a few hens that didn't get back in the hen house, and they would have a place in the barn where they would lay a bunch of eggs, and they would get rotten, and my brother and I would have egg fights. I mean, we had some real doozies. I'm going to tell you, when you get hit in the head by an egg that is about four weeks old, that thing not only stinks, but it's like a rock to the head. But that is not the experience that a lot of Americans have. Raised in a small town or raised in a big city. Until so they get their chance now. All we can do, and the Bible tells us to pray for those people. Unconditional love. Doesn't mean that you don't have a right to speak. You should have a right. Now that is another fence that is coming our way of not having the right to speak your mind. And that's the where we've got to be very careful. But we still need to show unconditional love and then pray, pray, pray to God. And not only just pray to God to deliver us and to give us guidance and strength, but also, as Wally has said many times as we read from Scripture, God has the power to turn the heart of the king with us whoever he will. He can turn it, dial it up, dial it back, based on the free will of believers and their volition to follow the word of God now. And if Christians don't start following the word of God, this virus is going to find more and more and more strange. God could put this thing out right now if he wanted to, but I think he's allowing it to teach us a lesson. And I don't see much repentance. Well, I'm not talking about you, but I'm talking about in general, keeping up with Christianity and what's going on in America. I don't see a lot more people showing 
that they have a desire to get to church if they can go to get the word of God. They're finding some dad gum fight to get in the pig. They're looking to pick a fight or to get in some kind of a political scrap with some group and they just shook church all together and wonder why it is that God just keeps judging this country. You're the problem, I say. Don't seem to see that. It galls me after 45 years of studying the Word of God that people don't think I've got the wisdom to give them advice on things they need to do when they don't know they're hiding from a hole in the ground about the Word of God. And they're letting some little knick-knack here on the Internet and some little knick-knack there on the Internet give them leading and guidance as if that was their pastor. Now that guy doesn't know them from Adam. And doesn't care about them. Doesn't think about their soul at night time. I've got people that are not in this church. I wish were back in here. That I think about their soul every night. I pray for them. And they could care less. There are sheep that should be in this church. That are not here that I care about. And they do not understand. And so they'll let some group here or some group there leading God and direct their life and this here, this is nothing to do and they'll let them work their little magic, whatever they can do to keep their rear end out of the church pew they'll do it and Satan's sitting there just like Nancy <laughs> clapping them on and they don't have the gumption to see it and it just torques me to no end it torques me it is righteous indignation People know where they need to be. They don't have any respect for me, for what I know and what I've learned. And they are going to answer for it. They're going to answer for it. In Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 17, I'll close with this. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 17 says, Obey them that have the rule over you. If you're supposed to be in this church, God gave me the rule over you. And I don't like it. Oh, Biden has the rule over America now. But the word get oh my means I've got a, a duty that comes to me. Y'all don't understand because you're not pastors. You don't have the calling. But God has given me the responsibility to teach the word of God to his people. And God has given you the responsibility to submit yourselves to the word. Not to me, not my whims, not what I want. I'm nobody. But God has given me that responsibility. And then it says here, for they watch for your soul. You think I only do that when we're here on Wednesday night or Sunday morning? Seven days a week I'm thinking about you people. I don't care where you live, how far you live in there. Seven days a week you're on my mind. I don't know how much I'm on your mind. I guess I am right now. But seven days a week you're on my mind. You're on my mind more than my own children are on my mind. You're on my mind more than my own wife is on my mind. Because there's so many of you and so just one of her. And three children and seven grandchildren. One's with the Lord. Six are still here on this world. One's done going on to the next waiting on us. But I am watching for your soul because I must give account. You don't have to give account for me. So you don't, you don't understand where I'm coming from? You understand. But those who are turned aside from the word don't understand. And they don't have to understand, but they do have to listen. And if they say, well, I don't want to listen to that, good. Wait till you stand before Esu Christu to Curio and tell him that. They must give an account of your soul. That's a whole lot to lay on an old sinner. It is. But God's laid that on this old sinner right here. Right here, y'all, y'all, and, and those who continue to come faithfully on Sundays, y'all, as far as I'm concerned, y'all the salt of the earth. And I, I look that there's going to be great things for all of you. When you go stand before Jesus Christ, because very few people will put up with me. <laughs> and other churches have their pastors. And their pastors may not understand that, but, and maybe they do, and they just don't want to say anything about it. God forbid that we didn't say something. 
It says that they may give an account that they may do it with joy and not with grief. I don't want to stand the judgment seat of Christ with grief and tears on my face every time one of y'all stands up there. I don't think I will with you. But there's some that I'm going to be crying like a baby. He says, for that is unprofitable for you. Not the pastor. Now, if, if, I'm, and if I'm wrong, he'll go burn my britches. And I know he will. Because I've actually got more to get my britches burned over than you do from his eyes because I'm in a sense a place of responsibility that he didn't lay on your heart. He'd given you other responsibilities. And I've been where you are too with those responsibilities for years. But agape love is that unconditional kind of love that God has for us that helps us to understand that we have to got, pull together in the word, look out for one another, put up with things of one another, bear, forbear, and the word forbear means to put up, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3, I think it is, that we are to forbear one another in love. This is what God wants us to do. And that's agape love. We don't always like it, but we are to forbear with one another in love. And if we look at our life through the lens or the prism of agape love that Jesus Christ gave as a commandment, we'll get through things. We'll get through it. And we will indeed, indeed get through it. And again, um, that's something that some people have yet to understand. When you have a devotion for Christ... It drives your con your conscience to a sense of a conviction that nothing in the world is any more important than the will of God. And I'm not saying that I always follow the will of God perfectly. None of us really do. But here we are. Here we are anyway. So let's remember to pray um, for our nation. Pray for our leaders. Pray for our state capitals. Pray for our military. And let's not forget pastors and missionaries and other church workers who are trying to do the job. Pray for those who are trying to help the people who are suffering with this dreaded pandemic that's got a lot of people on edge. Me too, to a certain degree. But um, you all are facing it just like I am. And uh, but let's just keep one another in prayer and but remember, there is a warfare that's going on that's more powerful than just a pandemic. It's powers and principalities. There, there is an enemy that's after us that uh, is not uh, invisible because evil is definitely around everywhere. And we know the bug that's getting into people, uh, they can see it in a microscope. But you can't see Satan in a microscope, but you sure can see the evil that's going on. And it is tearing people away from the church. It's tearing people away from faith in God. And there, some people are just losing all their senses, all of their senses. And it's pulling them away in their distraction, and it can become an idol. And so we have to be very careful. We have to be very careful. Father, we thank you for this day, and thank you for your kindness to us, your blessings. We thank you for the encouragement of your word and the truth that sets us free. And we realize that in the present tense of that passage that it keeps on setting us free if we keep on getting it. Heavenly Father, we realize in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 8 that your word tells us that light pushes out darkness. Light pushes out darkness. The infusion of truth, which is light, Father, we thank you that it pushes out evil intent, that it pushes out fear, anxiety, it pushes out idolatry, covetousness, and every vile sin that we can think of. It pushes it out of us. And so, Father, the more light we get, we thank you for it. And may it push us out and deliver us from evil. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for all you do for us, for all Jesus did in dying on the cross, all the brutal beatings that he took, the punishment that he took, the, the public shame that he did, he went through on our behalf. <clears throat> How he was slapped by people, spit on by people, had the hair pulled out of his face by people and a crown of thorns put on him and then he had his back ripped open by whose stripes we are healed. And then had to bear that great big heavy timber up to Golgotha and there have it put on a pole 
And there he was nailed by his wrist and his feet into a stake and stuck into the ground to die. And then made fun of even while he was there where he couldn't defend himself. Father, we know that Jesus could have called 10,000 angels and destroyed everyone there and relieved him of his pain and his misery. But he wouldn't do it. He stayed on that cross and went through everything he went through so that we could have our sins forgiven and go to heaven. Father, thank you for such love. We ask now, Father, that you just give us a, a little piece of that love that we can understand it. That you would be glorified and honored. And one day we're all going to come and say hallelujah and be with you. And thank you for everything you've done face to face with the Son. Father, thank you now for your plans. And we pray that we will be able to understand them and share them with others. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.